Hey, welcome to Adventure Christian Church at Home. My name is Brad McMahon, and I'm the lead pastor here at Adventure. And I just want to say thanks for tuning in with us here this morning. At Adventure, we get that, that life is an adventure. It's a journey, right? And it's got its twists and its turns, and sometimes life throws you for a loop. But here at Adventure, what we know and what we say is we get to take this journey together. And so we're just excited this morning that you're together along with us uh, in this adventure, in this journey called life. Now, first off, if you want to get connected with us, if you want to learn a little bit more about what we believe or what's going on here at the church, or maybe you're just thinking, I want to get connected with the Adventure Church family, it's really, really easy to do. All you have to do is text the word CONNECT, A-C-C, no spaces, to 97000. We would love to get connected with you. We'd love to help you know a little bit more about what's going on here at church and help you get plugged in here with the Adventure Church family. Now today, you may be thinking, and I just need some prayer, right? Life is crazy right now, and I just need someone to, uh, to pray for me, to pray with me. We would love to do that. And again, it's really easy. If you've got something going on in your life right now that you just need someone to pray for and pray with you, uh, you can text the word prayer, A-C-C, to 97000 because we believe in the power of prayer here. We believe that prayer works and that God loves to hear from us and loves to respond. Excited for this morning. Uh, we are continuing. In fact, today we are wrapping up our Grace Anatomy series uh, and we're excited for that. But now it's time for worship. So let's toss it over to Matt and the band. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship this morning. We're excited that you've tuned in and uh, decided to to huddle on the couch there and have church with us this morning. We at Adventure believe that God's at work around us all the time, even in this situation. Uh, he's created uh, new environments for us to uh, get close with our family, have some extra time there. Uh, hopefully you've taken advantage of that and made that time meaningful. Um, if I can encourage anything, try and keep your rhythm normal, try and, and keep some order and some structure in your life, whether you got kids or not, that's helpful for you. It's going to gonna break up some of that monotony, but just know as a staff, uh, we are praying for you uh, week in and week out, as long as this goes uh, for you to be safe and to uh, maintain your sanity and to, to, to make the most of connecting up with what God's doing in this situation. So that said, let me pray for us, and then we're going to worship a little bit together. God, we love you. We thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to worship together this morning. Uh, we're thankful for the technology that you provided us, the resources that we have to be able to make this time together possible. We love you. Be with us now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You 
are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. We lift our banner high. Jesus, from age to age you reign, your kingdom has no end, you are the only king forever, almighty God we lift you higher, you are the only king forever, forevermore, you are victorious, you are the only king forever, almighty God we lift you higher, you are the only king forever, Forevermore, you are victorious. Every week here at Adventure, we get the opportunity to celebrate this thing called communion. And the reason that it's a celebration is because we take a little bit of time to remember what Jesus did for us when he died on a cross, when he was buried in a tomb, and then three days later walked out of that tomb just like he said he would, we get a chance to celebrate that. We celebrate the life that comes from that moment. See, in the biographies of Jesus, these four books in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they tell this story of when Jesus, right before he's arrested, spends this this time with his small group around this table eating a meal together. And in that meal, Jesus takes a piece of bread and he breaks it and he says, hey, this bread is kind of like my body that's gonna be broken for you. And then he takes some some wine and he pours it into a cup and he says, this wine that's being poured into this cup is is a lot like my blood that's gonna be poured out for you. So every time you get together, do this and remember what I've done for you. Because what's, what's gonna happen as a result of this is a new covenant, right? Jesus says a new covenant, or what we would say is it's a new deal. There's a new deal on the table, a deal that is going to allow us to be able to access God, our Heavenly Father, freely and openly. And so today we get the opportunity to celebrate this together. So in your home, wherever you are, uh, whatever you have, maybe it's a saltine cracker, maybe it's some Cool Ranch Doritos, maybe it's some flaming Hot Cheetos, maybe it's bread out of your pantry, uh, grab that. And, and if you've got um, juice, then, then grab that as well. It could be orange juice, it could be grape juice, it could be water, it could be Mountain Dew, I don't know. But this is an opportunity for us to celebrate this together, to take that bread and to remember Jesus' body that was broken for us, and to take that juice and remember Jesus' blood that was poured out for us that makes this new life, this new deal possible. So anytime in the next song that you want to eat that bread and drink that juice and just say thank you to Jesus, you have the opportunity to do that as we worship together. Let me pray for us, and then we'll go into some worship. Jesus, you're good, and this morning, Father, we just say thank you for accomplishing what you accomplished on the cross and for the new life that it brings us. Jesus, we remember you now. We don't forget what you've done for us. And we say thank you with all our hearts. In your name we pray, amen. Take all I have in these hands and multiply, God, all that I am and find my heart on the altar again. Set me on fire, set me on fire, oh, take all I have in these hands and multiply, God, all that I am and find my heart on Y'all to again, set me on fire, set me on fire. Here I am, God, arms wide open, pouring out my life, 
gracefully broken my heart stands in all of your name your mighty love stands strong to the end you will fulfill your purpose for me you won't forsake me you will be with me here I am God arms wide open pouring out my life gracefully broken here I am God arms wide open pouring out Gracefully broken All to Jesus now All to Jesus now Holding nothing back Holding nothing back I surrender I surrender surrender I surrender here I am God arms wide open pouring out my life gracefully broken here I am God arms wide open Pouring out my life, gracefully broken. Here I am, God, arms wide open. Pouring out my life, gracefully broken. Here at Adventure Christian Church, we exist to create opportunities for people to come as they are with all of our mess, right? We don't have to check our mess at the door when we walk into church. We can bring all of the mess, all of the stress, all of the anxiety, whatever is going on in our lives, we can bring that into this place, right? We come as we are so that we can become all that God desires for us to be. That's why we exist, to create those opportunities for people to come as they are and become all that God desires for them to be. And one way that we worship here at Adventure is through giving, right? We believe that we give God what's first and not what's left over. And here at Adventure, there are three ways that you can give. One is you can give online through our website. You can go to adventureky.org give. The second way is to mail a check here to the church uh, where we can get that and make sure that we get that deposited for you. And the third way is to give through our app. Uh, we support not just what goes on here at Adventure, but our church loves to reach out into our community and support community ministries uh, and individuals in this community where we live. In addition to that, we support missionaries all over the world uh, that are on the front lines right now when it comes to battling this kind of virus, but also when it comes to battling for the hearts and souls of people around the world. So when you give to Adventure, it's not just something you're doing to keep the lights on here or pay staff here. A lot of this money goes straight out the door uh, to support uh, the mission work that's happening in the kingdom. Today, our challenge for our church is to serve 10, right? Last week, we talked about giving 10 and calling 10, meaning if you still had your $10 bill left over from our Give 10 challenge, that you were gonna use that to support local businesses or to call 10 people in your phone and just check on them. Well, this week, we're doing Serve 10. And so families and individuals around our community, we have the opportunity to serve the people in our neighborhoods or serve the people uh, where we live and in the communities where we live. And so what we're challenging you to do this week is to find 10 people and find a way to serve them. Maybe it's doing some yard work. Uh, maybe it's running to, to get some carry out and just surprising them uh, with some carry out at their front door. Or maybe it's sitting down and, and writing a card. Or if you've got kids, 
Maybe it's sitting down with your kids. I know in our kids' ministry this week, uh, one of the things they're being challenged to do is to draw a picture or write a card to send to a friend. Maybe it's the same kind of thing. Uh, a picture from a kid will brighten the day of someone who is stuck inside their home. And so this week, our challenge is to serve 10. And so we're looking for 10 people that we can serve in the communities that we live. Today, we are wrapping up our Grace Anatomy series. For the last five weeks, we've spent time in the book of Romans unpacking this thing called grace. What is it? What does it do? How do I get it? Who's it for? And here's the cool thing today. Today, Justin Burton, who is our youth pastor, he has the opportunity to land this whole plane for us. And so we're excited today to hear from Justin. So let's toss it over to Justin and let's wrap up Grace Anatomy. Good morning. Welcome to Adventure. Uh, if you're new to our church or maybe you're just tuning in for the first time for our live stream this morning, you might be wondering who I am and where Brad is. Uh, my name is Justin and I am the student pastor here at Adventure. So Brad had asked me a few weeks ago if I would finish up our Grace Anatomy series this week. And little did I know that it was going to look like this, but I'm still super excited to get into God's Word with you all this morning. So these last five weeks, we've been going through the Book of Romans talking about this thing called grace. Now, if you remember, Brad said that grace is a lot like our hearts, that our hearts are a vital part of who we are, that without our hearts, we die. Well, grace is the same that our heart, pushes our, our heart pushes life into our bodies, but grace pushes life into our souls. Now, we in these last, last few weeks have been asking a question every single week about grace. So if you're new or maybe you've missed a couple weeks, let's get refreshed, let's get caught up so we can all see this beautiful picture of grace that God has laid out in Romans. So our first week we asked the question, what is grace? So we see Paul define sin and he demonstrates the snowball effect that sin creates when it's unchecked. That sin wrecks everything and everyone. And the only thing that cures sin, the effect of sin, is justification that comes by grace through faith in Christ. Grace is something that we need, but it's not something that we deserve. Week two, we ask the question, how do I get grace? And here's the answer. You can't just get it. You can only receive it. So grace is given, it's not earned. And we live in this performance-based culture where we're driven to earn things. And with grace, we receive it because of who we are, not based on what we can do. God works differently. And he says, I'm going to give this to you, and there's nothing that you can do to get it. Just have faith. So faith is us believing and trusting that God is who he says he is that he can do all that he's promised, and even when it doesn't seem true or possible. Then we ask the question, what does grace do? And the answer is, grace gives us a new life and a new way to live. So I mean, here's a big truth I need you to understand about grace, is that grace does not make sin safe. When we, re when we receive grace, we put this old way of living aside, and we step into this new life and a new way of living. So last week, Brad asked the question, well, what's this new way to live? And the new way to live is a life that surrenders to, that follows, that's led by, that's lived in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Now this new way of living, it's all about surrender. It's you saying, I'm done trying to drive this thing, so God, I'm gonna let you drive. You know that old Jesus take the wheel song. So, I'll go where you want to take me. That's what you're saying. I will live the way that you want me to live. I'll become who you desire for me to become. And every step of the way, what's comforting is that the Holy Spirit is there to keep us on the right path. So we also have a question today, and that question is, who is grace for? And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give you the answer. Grace is for all, not just for some. And we're going to see this truth displayed in Romans 15 today. It's going to tell us the exact answer. So as you're turning to Romans 15 at home, let's see what's going on in this book first. So there's this, there's this dude named Paul, and God had radically transformed him, and he became a missionary. And Paul desired for every person and in every nation, nation to come to know Jesus. So there's this church in Rome. They were having a ton of struggles. They were just having issues. 
And Paul had a relationship with the leaders of that church. And when he heard about these struggles, he knew it was time to write a letter. In this letter, the whole point was to show them what they were doing wrong, correct them, but then encourage them. And this letter talks a ton about grace. And that's what leads us into Romans 15 today. So let's start out in verse 1. Now we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself. On the contrary, as it's written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction, so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the scriptures. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in a harmony with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that you may glorify the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. Therefore accept one another, just as Christ has also accepted you to the glory of God. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. God, thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you that we were able to have online church. I humbly come before you as I'm getting ready to preach your word. I pray that, Lord, you would lead me with your spirit. I pray that as we go through Romans 15, your name is to be magnified and glorified as we do so. Lord, I pray that everyone's hearts will be open to what you have to say to them this morning. Amen. So I heard this funny story recently. It's pretty interesting, so I thought I'd share it with you guys. So there was this kind of elderly woman, and she wanted to go on a two-week vacation at a, at a particular campground. And she was asking about reservations, and she wanted to know if it was fully equipped, but she didn't know how to ask the question about the toilet. She thought it was a little crude and didn't want to say it. So as she's thinking, she comes up with this term, bathroom commode, okay? And she still thought bathroom commode was still a little bit too forward. So what she does is she takes this term bathroom commode and she just simplifies it. And she says, BC. So in this, in this email that she wrote, she says, does it have its own BC? Does the campground have its own BC? So you can see this is going to be rough. So the campground owner, he gets this email. He reads it, and I'm sure like all of us, he's super confused and has no idea what she's talking about. So he thinks about it for a little bit, and he's like, I don't know. So he goes to some other people in the campground, and he asks them, hoping maybe they'd know. They had no idea. So he comes to this conclusion that she must and has to be talking about the local Baptist church. So this is going nowhere good very fast. So this is the reply that he sent. Dear Madam, I regret very much the delay in answering your letter, but now I take pleasure of informing you that the BC is located nine miles north of the campsite and is capable of seating 250 people at one time. I miss quite a distance away if you're in the habit of going regularly, but no doubt you'll be pleased to know that a great number of people take their lunches along and make a day of it. They usually arrive early and they stay late. And my wife and I, last time we went was last year, but it was so crowded we had to stand up the whole time that we were there. And it may interest you to know that right now, there's a supper plan to raise money to buy more seats. So they plan to hold this supper in the middle of the BC so everyone can watch and talk about this great event. I'd like to say it pains me very much not to be able to go more regularly, but it's for sure not for a lack of desire on my part. And it gets tougher when we see this cold weather. Now, if you decide to come down to the campground, perhaps my family could go with you the first time you go. We could sit with you, introduce you to the kind folks. This is a really friendly community. So this is, this is crazy. But what we see here is that context is super important. Knowing context could have saved this whole situation, could have saved this elderly woman from experiencing possibly the most horrifying and confusing thing that she's ever seen. So in regard to our text today of Romans 15, we got to understand the context that Paul is writing the church. We're going to have no idea what he's talking about. So to understand this context, let's first rewind back into chapter 14, Romans chapter 14. And this is super important because it's going to make sense of what Paul is trying to tell them in 15. So let's check out Romans 14, starting in verse 1. Accept anyone who is weak in faith, but don't argue about disputed matters. One person believes he may eat anything, 
while one who is weak eats only vegetables. One who eats must not look down on one who does not eat, and one who does not eat must not judge the one who does, because God has accepted him. Let's, let's pause real quick. You see what's happening here. These are people in the church that are fighting over their food preferences. They're causing all this trouble in the church because of food preferences. So let's keep on going to verse 4. Who are you to judge one another's household servant? Before his own Lord he stands and falls, and he will stand, because the Lord is able to make him stand. One person judges one day to be more important than the other day. Someone else judges every day to be the same. Let each one be fully convinced in his mind. Whoever observes the day, observes it for the honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats for the Lord, and he gives thanks to God. Whoever does not eat, is for the Lord that he does not eat, and he gives thanks to God. So let me ask you, in your lives, does this look familiar to you? So we see this fighting, finger pointing, and judgment. Now, I want you to see this connection in both the first verses of chapter 14 and 15, when we see these two words, weakness and strength. And what we have to understand here that, is that these people are looking at their friends, the people they live life with, and they, they're saying, I do this right, you do this wrong. So be, be more like me. They're saying, my way is strong and your way is weak. Now, how often do we not just see this in the church, but in our lives? My way is right and your way is wrong. So these verses, what we got to understand, are not saying that the ones who eat meat are strong and all the vegans are weak. That's not what it's saying. It's referring to these different preferences in living out the Christian lifestyle. It's just lifestyle preferences. So when we, in these verses, the one who eats anything, he does this because he believes he's free in Christ to do so. The one who just eats the vegetables, they do this because they believe it most honors Christ. That's why they're doing this. So Paul is like, guys, stop the arguing. Whatever you're doing, I don't care if you're eating meat or eating vegetables, honor Christ in doing it. So these are the people that Paul's writing to. That's their situation. And they're bickering and they're arguing over meaningless things. And instead of focusing, uh, instead, they're focusing on this grace that's only been given to them without extending this grace to their brothers and sisters in Christ. And because they were not extending grace to others, they had this lack of growth, but, but also a lack of unity. We see this stuff at work and at school, in our lives, and we kind of expect it. But Paul is talking about the church here. These are Christians, people who are supposed to love Jesus, who are fighting and judging each other over meaningless things. So let's get back into Romans 15. Let's check out verse 1. Now we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Now let's think about this in relation to adventure, our church. So we all have these different methods of worship, right? They're never exactly going to line up. So some of us raise our hands when we're singing. Some of us don't. Some of us, we sing real loud, and some of us are pretty quiet. And I'm sure you guys are glad that I sing quiet because you're not trying to hear me sing out loud. Uh, and some of us take extensive notes when Brad's preaching, and some of us just meditate on what he's saying without distraction. Some of us, when we feel the, the Holy Spirit, we may smile and joyfully laugh. But like me, there's this weird, ugly cry that some people have when we feel God moving. And let me tell you this morning, like, I know, I get it, I'm not the best looking. And when I hit that ugly cry, like, it's a rough scene. Trust me on that. But you, you see what I'm saying here, is that we have differences in the way we honor God in our church right now, just like they did in the Roman church 2,000 years ago. And we don't just have these differences in the church. Like, how about that person at work who organizes everything totally different than you? The person that comes to work with the smelliest food that just smells up the whole office. You know, for you kids, the ones at school who may sit next to you and ask a question like every five minutes. Or maybe you are that kid. Like, who knows? But what we got to understand is that we do our stuff different. We live life different. And we often think that we're right in doing so. But here's the thing, our differences cannot be stripped away. So you may ask, like, how do we deal with those differences then? So let's check out verse 2. Each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. 
So we're called to live in harmony with all these differences. Now, if, if our leadership here at church was to make this statement, you can only come to a venture if you raise your hands at least once during worship. Now, obviously, we would not do this because that's an absurd demand. But what would that do to our church? It's for sure going to limit who's walking in these doors on a Sunday morning. Not only are we going to lose partners in our ministry, but we're not going to be fulfilling the ultimate goal of our church. And the ultimate goal of this church is for people to find Jesus and to grow in the knowledge and power of Him. So putting restrictions and rules on these non-essential topics harm the good of the whole body. Now you guys know I'm a, I'm a huge Ohio State fan, so a big OH to you guys at home. But if I were to make this rule that you, the only way you can enter my apartment is if you wear scarlet and gray. And if you don't know, that's Ohio State's colors. And if you're wearing Michigan colors, like don't, don't knock on the door. And better yet, don't even come down the hallway. Like I'm not letting you in. But if I were to do this, very few of my friends are going to fit in this category. I'm going to have a pretty antisocial life. When my life becomes centered around my preferences, I lose touch with everyone else. And it's the same with the church. When our lives become centered around our preferences, we lose touch with everyone else. So we're to seek to please others, not ourselves. We're to do that to help them grow, not us, but to help them grow. So I asked that question earlier, who is grace for? Grace is for all, not just for some. So we got to ask ourselves this question. What will build the faith of others and help them live more by faith in future grace? So hear me on that. Every day we got to ask ourselves that question. What will build the faith of others and help them live more by faith in future grace? But you hear that. Like, did you hear that word? It's that grace word again. The one we've been talking about these last few weeks. In these last sermons, we've been talking about a very I-centered grace, a grace that's surrounded around me. It's all about me, which that's incredible because I need grace. I need to receive grace to be transformed and saved from my sin. But this chapter asks the question, so you've received this grace. Now, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? So who's it for? Simply, we see that we're to extend it to everyone, not just some, but everyone. And I promise you, when we do this, this will move the weak towards strength. And it's going to guard the strong from a know-it-all, individualistic Christianity. Hear me there. When we do this, the weak are going to be moved towards strength. And the strong are going to be guarded from being know-it-alls and living the Christian life as individuals. Don't make it a priority to please yourself. But be the kind of person who finds satisfaction and denying your preference for the good of others. We have to understand that often our preferences are not for the greater good of the body. And when somebody, when somebody points that out to us, we should be joyful. Now I get that sounds absolutely crazy that we should be joyful when someone points out that our preferences aren't the best. But you gotta understand that when this happens, we are going to grow, and so do our brothers and sisters, the people we care about. Now, when we do this, this allows us to celebrate diversity in our church. It allows us to look across Adventure Christian Church on a Sunday morning to see a possible glimpse of what heaven looks like. And these ideas, they're very easy to talk about, you know, but they're very difficult to, get, to live out. And I get that. And they're very hard for me too. I struggle living this out, giving away grace on a daily basis. I struggled with it yesterday and today, and I'm going to tomorrow. But the good thing is we have an example. And Christ is the empowering example of humility. Let's go to verse 3. For even Christ did not please himself. On the contrary, as it's written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Christ is the most perfect example of this because he took the insults of others. And note that these insults that it's talking about here were not his to bear. But why did he do it? He did so so that good could come to his children, so that salvation could be offered to a sinful humanity. Now please understand here, this doesn't mean that Jesus is just perfectly okay with any lifestyle. Jesus was bringing change. 
Jesus didn't take on sin to make sin okay. Hear me there. Jesus was coming to bring change. So Jesus didn't take on my sin just to make my sin okay. So think about it. When Jesus encountered people in the Bible, before he left them, he said, go and sin no more. Note that in chapter 14, what we read a couple minutes ago, Paul said, in all things, in every single thing in your life that you do, give glory to God when doing it. Honor Him in doing it. So this doesn't just dismiss or excuse sinful behavior. Remember a few weeks ago, remember that Jesus invites us to a new life and to a new way of living. But as it relates to differences with people in our lives, we're to see that Christ set this example of how we're to react. Our desires are not to be for other people to change their preferences just to fit ours. And what's crazy is we're supposed to suffer personally to extend love and grace to create unity. That's the ultimate grace, to suffer that someone else may be exalted. And I get it. This is super difficult. And if, if I want something in my life, if I have a preference and I want something, then I want it. But as I see a diverse group of people, not just in our church, but in my life, I see that my desires aren't always best for everybody else. So suffer personally to extend love and grace to create unity. Let's take a look at verse 4. For whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction, so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the Scriptures. Scripture sustains a grace-filled life. God gave us Scripture, not just as a set of rules or a lifestyle book, but He gave it to us to get to know Him, to see His character throughout all time. Scripture is meant to encourage, correct, show love, sustain, and unite His people. When we feel that extending grace to others can be difficult, frustrating, and often angering, it is, we got to go to Scripture to persevere. And we are going to have disagreements in our church body. We're going to. But we're also going to have them in our lives a ton. Scripture is what's going to sustain you in that struggle. We know this because we see countless examples of people in the Bible who totally mess this up. But we also see some people that got it right. That's what gives me hope and comfort. So we got to ask ourselves, what's the character of God in the Bible? Who is he? And how should that lead me in my current situation? And you're probably thinking, like, Justin, I know this. WWJD, duh, like, what would Jesus do? I learned this when I was a kid. I don't want you to ask the question, what would Jesus do? But think about it for a moment. Be thinking that if Jesus was here now, he came into our church in, in a midst of an argument or a lack of unity, what would he tell you specifically to do? If Jesus was in our current situation of coronavirus, online church 2020, how would he love each of us and how would he command you to love and care for one another? And trust me, when it's tough to do so, Scripture will sustain your perseverance. Let's follow along as we read verses 5 and 6. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. Now this harmony that Paul's talking about, it's not that we share the same food, the same music style, or the same worship preferences. It's, it's that we share the same spiritual values that these past verses have been talking about. And we see in here, Paul says, according to Christ Jesus, and he says this because that very same Christ Jesus modeled this perfectly in verse 3. Now these values, they're there for us to, to do all things to help one another grow in their faith journey. That's why they're there. And when we do so, we practice self-denial. And when we do that, we follow the values that the Holy God has given us in Scripture toward unity. That's not by yourself, but that's in unity. So the whole purpose of this is to give glory to God, like Paul said here, with one mind and one voice. Now let me ask you a question real quick. Have, have any of you ever listened to this beautiful choir, like this big choir, and all you could do is have tears in your eyes as you're, as you're watching, as you're listening? So why do we do that? We as a sinful, as sinful, messy, 
broken humans, I think we still have this recognition that there's a beauty and a rawness to unity. So in this choir, there are many individuals. They all have different parts and roles, but yet they send their message as one mind and one voice. And that's why it's incredible. So how do you think our Creator, the God who came and lived a life and died on a cross for us, how do you think He feels as He watches us live in unity that is of one mind and of one voice? How beautiful would that be? Think about that. Now when I say one voice, you might be wondering what I'm talking about. And I simply mean that this is with our mouths. The outer form of us showing what's in our hearts is what we're saying. So Matthew 12, 34 says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When we have one voice, we're not bad-mouthing each other. We're not bickering and arguing all the time. And, and as a staff at this church, we have some ground rules set in this area. So we can have disagreements, and we can because we're very different people, and we all have different preferences. But the thing is, we can also engage in dialogue, dialogue but once we leave that room, we are one united front. Brad's led us to be one voice. That's what the body of Christ is to be, one voice. Paul also says to be of one mind, and this is simply that we share the same spiritual values. This is, please pay attention here, that this is not talking about our preferences. This is not talking about what we eat. It's not talking about what we wear or how our worship styles look. This is talking about the values of our church. So if you're new, or maybe you just need a refresher, we have the values of our church that are called the high five. So we're going to go through them just real quick so we can see what the values of our church are. The first value is that we live the way. We live connected to the Word of God, under the authority of God, within the will of God, and empowered by the Spirit of God. Our second value is that we're better together that God did not intend for us to do life alone, that we're designed to partner together. Value three is that we step into the mess, and, and that means that we cannot love and care from a distance, that we're not, just like Jesus, we are not afraid to get our hands dirty to love and serve sacrificially. Value four is that we bring hope to everyone. So people have to know that you care before they care what you know. Everyone needs a chance at the hope of Jesus. Our last value, value five, is that we join the movement. And this just means that Jesus came to start this gospel movement of multiplication through disciple making. And he has commissioned us to do so and he's equipped us to join this movement today. These are the values of our church. They all came directly from scripture. And by prioritizing this high five in your life, that's how we can live as one mind like Christ commands us to do here. And please remember that even in the midst of disagreements on our preferences or what we like, we can still be one mind, one voice, and one body of Christ. It's all about our values, and most importantly, that our values came directly from God's Word. So I asked this question at the beginning. That our question today is, who is grace for? Like I said earlier, the answer is that grace is for all, not just for some. So let's take a look at our last verse today, verse 7. Therefore accept one another, just as Christ has also accepted you to the glory of God. In this month, we've been talking about a very eye-centered grace, and a grace that's revolved around me, which, like I said earlier, is that's awesome, because I need grace to be redeemed. I need that grace. But the question is that I want to ask you today is, you, okay, great, you've received it, but what are you going to do with that grace now? Will you keep that grace for yourself or will you extend it to others? In these last few weeks, I know it's been crazy with this coronavirus. Our country's, I mean, it's been insane. Everyone's buying up bottled water. Uh, you can't find Germex anywhere because everybody's reselling it on eBay. Like stuff's crazy. And last week I was at a Walmart. And if you guys don't know, I work for Home City Ice as a delivery driver. So I'm pulling this pallet out of the back of the Walmart to go stock it. And at the same time, the employees were pulling a pallet of toilet paper, okay? So as they pull it out, I'm not lying to you, before, before they could even get out the door, there are people jumping and arguing and like fighting for this toilet paper. It was absolutely insane. It was crazy. It was really something to see. But we know that all of this 
is crazy behavior. Like that's not how we should be acting, hoarding all of this. But the question I have for you is how often do you treat grace in your life the exact same way? That you hoard it up, you view it as being yours alone, it's my grace, and that we don't extend it to others. Verse 7 here is commanding us to accept every person in grace. Every single person. And why? It's because He first accepted us. So if you're listening today and you're new to this whole Jesus thing, or maybe you can say, hey, you know what? I know I'm not a Christian, but I'm curious. Let me tell you today that there is a God that desires to heal your brokenness, and His name's Jesus. You can never be too far gone that the blood of Jesus cannot redeem you. Christ came to this world, this broken and sinful world that needed saving. And Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. And let me tell you, I promise 100% your sin will be paid for by death. Someone will pay for your sin by death. It can either be you or Jesus. But there's this hope found in the second half of Romans 6.23 when it says, "But, but the gift of God is eternal life. Christ loves you, and He deeply wants a relationship with you today. And I urge you to surrender to Him. If you have some questions about this, please, please, I'm begging you, get on our website today. Contact any of us here on our staff. We would love to have that gospel conversation with you. We want you to know Jesus. So thank you very much for joining us at Adventure today. Let's pray before we head out. God, thank you for today. Thank you that we could come to you in church in this way. Uh, I pray that everyone that's sitting on their couches listening to this right now, that God, you would protect them from this virus, that you would keep them safe. Lord, thank you for being so gracious to us. Thank you that you have given us grace. I pray that as we go this week, that we will make it a goal of ours to extend grace to others. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Water you turn into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you There's none like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you there's none like you. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God. Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you There's none like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Then what could stand against? Our God is greater, 
Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Then what could stand against? Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us this morning here at Adventure Christian Church at home. Would love to get you more and more connected. And if you want to learn more, you have the opportunity this week to go to adventureky.org slash adventure at home uh, to follow along with us. There's devotionals, there's information and things for kids there. There's also past worship services if you want to check those out as well. Uh, those are there. Please follow along there this week as we'll be adding more content for you and for your family. Also, don't forget about Serve 10. We're looking for the opportunity to serve 10 people in our area, to be the church, not just go to church, but to be the church, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to love people like Jesus would in and around your area. So we're excited again uh, for Adventure Christian Church at home. Thanks for joining us, and we will see you again next Sunday.